Professor Song Han is an assistant professor at MIT EECS. He received his PhD degree from Stanford University. His research research focus on efficient deep learning computing. He's proposed a deep compression technique that can reduce uh, neural network size by order of magnitude without losing uh, accuracy and or implementation for efficient inference engine that first exploit the pruning with sparsity in deep learning accelerator. His team works on hardware aware neural search, neural architecture search, they bring deep learning to IoT device. Uh, devices was uh, highlighted also by MIT News, Wired, uh, Qualcomm News, VentureBit, IEEE Spectrum, uh, integrated in PyTorch and AutoGluon, and received many low power computer vision contest hours in flagship AI conference, CVPR, ICCV, NeurIPS. Song, uh, uh, Professor Song uh, received the best uh, paper award at ICLR 16, FPGA 17, Amazon, Amazon Machine Learning Research Award, Sony Faculty Award, Facebook Faculty Award, NVIDIA Academies Partnership Award, and was named as 35 uh, innovators under 35 by MIT Technology Review for his uh, uh, contribution on decompression techniques uh, and lets a powerful artificial intelligence uh, program run more efficiently on low power mobile devices. Uh, finally, uh, Professor Song received the, the NSF Career Award for Efficient Algorithm Hardware for Accelerated Machine Learning at the IEEE AI 10 to Watch, the future of AI Award. Thanks again, uh, Professor Anna, to attend. And uh, please, I leave you the floor. Thank you. Hey, thank you. I'm glad to present our uh, latest research for on device learning under 256 kilobytes of memory. So, can we learn on the edge? So, we believe AI systems need to continuously adapt to new data collected from the sensors. So we have to run not only inference, but also be able to run back propagation locally on these edge devices. So on-device learning has several advantages. For example, better privacy, where you don't have to transmit the data to the cloud to, to train that, but everything can be trained locally. So it can have a lower cost. Um, and also it enables customization. You, you know, imagine you have an app, uh, app on the app store, so every user can customize to their voice, to their habit, et cetera. And also can enable lifelong learning to learn new concepts. However, training is much more expensive than inference. It is difficult to fit those edge devices with a tight limited, um, with a limited amount of memory. So that's the problem we are going to solve. Some background uh, related work uh, from our group, uh, we propose this MCU net that bring AI inference to IoT devices with image net level. So AI on microcontroller is hard. It has no DRAM, no operating system, and suffer from extreme memory constraint, right? And existing work um, optimized for the number of parameters and flops, but actually the number of activation is the real bottleneck since MCU has limited SRAM only about a couple of hundred kilobytes. Uh, and we can achieve more than 70% image net top end accuracy on a microcontroller. So throughout the years, uh, the, the peak activation size is, is actually going down from VGG to ResNet to MobileNet V2 to MobileNet V2 uh, to MCUNet V2 with the same accuracy. So for cloud AI, people use ResNet. For mobile AI, we have MobileNet. For tiny AI, we have MCUNet. And last year, we proposed a second version of MCUNet, uh, which is a patch-based inference method that can run uh, visual, uh, visual wakeboards within only 30 kilobytes of memory. So throughout the years, we've been pushing the frontier for this uh, memory and accuracy uh, trade-off, improving the uh, uh, memory consumption by uh, uh, about six times within the past three years. So what about training? So training memory is much larger than inference due to two factors. One is the batch size. The other is we have to store the intermediate activations for back propagation. So we find activation is the major bottleneck, not the trainable parameters. So from ResNet 50 um, to uh, MobileNet V2 1.4, they have the same accuracy. 
The parameters of mobile net reduced by 4x. However, the major bottleneck, which is the activation, improved by only 10%. So that's, a, that's the a limitation for conventional model design. We are not designed for on-device training. Number of parameters is the focus, but actually the number of activation didn't improve much. What about just fine tuning the last layer? It indeed saved a lot of memory, but it suffers from significant accuracy degradation. What about related work on parameter efficient transfer learning? So that can reduce the number of trainable parameters by 12x, but suffer from accuracy loss. But the actual um, memory saving is only 80%, right? So parameter efficiency does not directly translate to memory efficiency. So 12x versus only 80%. And also it suffers from uh, a big accuracy loss. So we propose a tiny TL in NeuroIPS 20. So tiny TL stands for tiny transfer learning, which is a memory efficient transfer learning. So we uh, use three techniques. One is uh, fine tune the bias only. Okay, So we only fine tune the bias without having to, to store the intermediate activations. According to the chain rule, Finding the gradient with respect to the weight requires storing the activation, but getting the gradient for the, uh, for the bias doesn't require storing the intermediate activations. Okay, So um, there's a question, what do you mean by memory for activation? So that's the uh, memory that you have to uh, store for the intermediate activations, right? All right, so um, back to this discussion. Um, we find by fine tuning the bias only, we don't need to store those intermediate activations. And in order to compensate for the loss of the capacity, we add a light residual learning, okay? Just a very lightweighted, low resolution, low channel number branch to learn the residual only. And then we propose use the once for all approach to use different subnetworks for different tasks. For example, we can use a smaller subnet for easier task and use a larger subnet for a more challenging task. So this leads to no uh, high accuracy and a, a real uh, memory saving rather than just um, optimize for the number of trainable parameters. However, um, training on microcontroller is still challenging since this still roughly require like a hundred megabytes of memory cost. So training on microcontroller requires a couple of hundred kilobytes of memory rather than 100 megabytes, right? So this is the um, platform, uh, this is the memory consumption for training with TensorFlow, PyTorch, and Minion. It's hundreds of megabytes. So recently we've been working on on-device training under only 256 kilobytes of memory. So the major uh, reduction comes from uh, one is tiny training engine, which is our in-house design training library for microcontrollers that enable uh, image recognition um, transfer learning on microcontrollers. The other major uh, saving comes from this sparse layer and sparse tensor update. Another saving comes from this quantization aware scaling and also operator reordering. So we'll start with op addressing the optimization difficulty of quantized graphs. So enable quantized training is super important for training on microcontrollers and IoT devices. And the key difference from prior work is that there is a lot of research on uh, quantization aware training, QAT, on a fake quantization graph. However, that is done on the cloud where uh, on the GPU, which is targeting uh, getting a, um, a quantized graph for inference. However, during uh, fake quantization, the computation graph it's still uh, FP32, we have FP32 in the back, right? So we have FP32 weights, uh, they, uh, they, they are passed through this quick quantizer operator, which basically uh, first project the, the value from its original uh, value to one, minus 128 and plus 127, and then round it and project it back, okay? And after the projection, everything is still done in FP32 arithmetic, right? So for uh, on-device training, we don't have the luxury to have this uh, fake quantization graph, right? So we are truly limited by memory and we have to deal with this real quantized graph where the weights and activations are both stored in the aid only. There is no FP32 counterpart in the back. 
Okay, and we have to do the convolution yeah, in the eight, accumulate in the 32, add a bias in 32 and uh, multiply by a P32 scaling factor and project it back to in, in eight. And now we don't have the luxury to have the batch normalization either since batch norm is folded into the convolution. So this is suffering from uh, loss of accuracy if we, if we train naively on this real quantization graph, okay? About more than 10% top end accuracy loss uh, using int8 with a standard SGD due to um, um, lack of IP32 and also lack of uh, batch normalization. So why is the convergence worse, like 10% worse? So we try to investigate the reason and plotted the uh, ratio between weight and the gradient, right? Since weight is equal to weight plus the learning rate times the gradient, we want to make sure for every layer, the ratio between weight and gradient roughly stay constant. However, we find from uh, FP32 to int8, previously this is weight over gradient uh, in log scale, and this is after uh, a training on a real quantizer graph. First of all, um, the ratio increased by uh, 10 orders of magnitude. Okay? And another uh, factor is for different layers, it can fluctuate a lot up to like five orders of magnitude difference for weights and biases and for different layers, right? So what caused such fluctuation? What is, uh, so this is a very interesting phenomenon, right? So we try to investigate it mathematically. So for a real quantized graph from a uh, int eight uh, to IP32, there is a scaling factor, right? So the original weight equals to the scaling factor times the quantized weight. The scaling factor basically projects from uh, the original um, um, scale into uh, minus 128 and plus 127. Right. Therefore, according to the chain rule, the, the gradient with respect to the quantized weight equal to uh, the scaling factor times the gradient of the original weight. Right. So this is chain rule of uh, backpropagation. So if we calculate the new uh, ratio between weight and gradient, okay, we plug in the weight, which is equal to um, the original weight divided by the scaling factor, and we plug in uh, the gradient with respect to the weight. It's also a scaling factor times the original uh, gradient. So put them together, there is a scaling factor to the power of minus two of the original weight over gradient. So this is the issue that caused um, the big shift of the ratio of weight over gradient. And this ratio could be different for different channels, different layers, since the, uh, the scaling factor is per channel, right? So we need to scale it back. Okay. So this is a fixed scaling factor for each channel and for each layer that doesn't require any hyperparameter fine tuning. Okay. Then we just scale, rescale the gradients using um, this scaling factor, right? As time to the power of minus two for the weight and also for the uh, for the bias. Okay. So by applying such quantization of our scaling, we can uh, almost match the original W over G ratio of uh, P32 version, okay? So it's a very simple yet super effective method. Doesn't require any hyperparameter fine tuning or uh, any hyperparameter tuning, but mathematically uh, we should apply um, this quantization of aware scaling in all um, quantized training on real quantized graphs. Okay, so let's see the accuracy. After this QAS quantization of aware scaling, we can fully match the original accuracy. Okay, compared with other approaches like intent Lars, uh, later adaptive uh, scaling versus the atom, um, they either suffer from low accuracy or have extra memory, like three X uh, extra memory to maintain the uh, intermediate states. Okay, so that's the first uh, method, which is quantization aware scaling for uh, dealing with real quantized graph. Second contribution is actually the sparse layer sparse tensor update. So rather than the full update, Previously, we explored bias only update, which only update the bias. It doesn't require storing the intermediate activations. We can also do sparse layer update, right? Only uh, update certain layers and even sparse tensor update to uh, update certain only certain channels within the layer. 
for example, if we do stop response tensor backward, um, getting the uh, originally getting the gradient with respect to the weight, we need to store all the activations, which is pretty big. But if we need to only calculate one quarter of the gradient of the weight, we need to store only one quarter of the activations, which is pretty cool. Therefore, we want to understand how do we automatically figure out which layer needs to be updated, which layer does not. Intuitively, the last couple of layers are more important and needs to be updated. And how exactly is how um, how uh, what exactly is the last couple of layers? So we plotted this contribution analysis to uh, fine tune each layer individually as a proxy to see the uh, the contribution of this layer. And we find as we increase the number of layers after the bias, indeed we get a higher and higher accuracy. But it quickly saturates from uh, fine tuning the last about twenty five. Uh, layers, okay? So we stop here. This is the position we are going to fine tune the bias, okay? So for bias update, accuracy goes higher as more layers are updated, but it plateaus pretty soon. Uh, what about for the weight, okay? For weight update, we find those later layers are more important, okay? And for uh, point-wise, depth-wise, point-wise, the first point-wise calm contributes more than the depth-wise layer. And then we tried updating all, all the channels, half the channel, quarter channel, one eighth of the channel, and plotted this contribution ana analysis. We can find fine tuning the first 10 layers doesn't make sense and even hurt the accuracy sometimes since they extract the low level features that is not specific to different downstream tasks. But really, the later layers need to be updated and contributes more. And interestingly, the uh, depth depth rise layer is better not to update them. Okay, so it has pretty pretty small capacity. Updating them uh, sometimes even hurt the accuracy, which is a good thing since the uh, depth rise layer has a large ex uh, expansion ratio, usually six three to six, which results in a large amount of uh, memory. So being able to uh, keep them constant actually reduces the training memory. So just update the first uh, point wise layer. So here we plotted the uh, activation memory in yellow and also the weight memory in blue and see what is the sweet spot. So we can find um, the first couple of layers have pretty high activation memory due to large resolution. The last couple of layers has pretty large weight memory due to the um, large number of channels. Okay, so the middle layer has really, really has low memory cost. So our um, contribution analysis is basically saying we need to update some of the intermediate layers in the middle, okay, sparse layer update, which has low memory cost. And for the later layers, since they, has, they have pretty large uh, weight tensor, we decided, uh, the algorithm decided to run this sparse tensor update, okay? So only updating one eighth and one quarter of the tensor, okay? And how was this one eighth, one quarter decided? So actually that's mathematically you running, we are run, running this optimization function where we want to maximize the accuracy coming from the bias and also from the weight. And how many layers do we tune uh, for the bias is denoted by K. And which layer needs to be updated and which, uh, what is the ratio we need to update is denoted by, denoted by I and R. And we are going to maximize the summation of um, these accuracy contributions subject to the memory consumption of KIR is smaller or equal than the um, or equal to the constraint. Okay, so using that heuristic, uh, it decides to update these layers. Okay, so um, these sparse updates resulted in low memory and high accuracy, so up to 7.5x smaller memory consumption, but having a much higher uh, higher accuracy averaged across. 10 image classification uh, data sets. Okay, so this is transferred from uh, ImageNet to these downstream uh, vision tasks. And we plotted for MCUNet, MobileNet V2, 0.35, and proxy is not 0.3. Okay, and compared with updating the, uh, only the biases, this has a big advantage. 
Okay, so uh, for tiny, uh, for sparse layer sparse tensor update, existing training infrastructure doesn't support that. In order to turn this theoretical saving into measured memory saving, we uh, designed our in-house tiny training engine. Okay, so we can first get an input graph, forward graph, and then we perform the auto diff uh, compile time to get the backward graph, and then we prune the graph for those um, sparse layer and sparse tensor update and perform this operator reordering to quickly release the buffers. And then we compile them into binary by code gen and perform on-device training. So let's first re review the previous DL training infra. We first need to get a computational graph for forward. And then we run the auto grad engine to get a computation graph for the back backward. <coughs> And next, we um, uh, we uh, get the detailed execution schedules. So previously, all these parts on the right hand side are done at the uh, runtime, which gives a lot of flexibility, but it hurts the efficiency. And for uh, tiny machine learning, we believe uh, such modality is not optimal, and we need to have a completely new paradigm for uh, tiny on device training since uh, this runtime auto diff is consuming too much overhead. One overhead is the runtime is heavy. Um, auto diff at the runtime is super inefficient. It has heavy dependencies and, and have a large binary size. So binary size is super important for microcontrollers since we have only like one or two megabytes of, uh, of flash, even the binary matters. So all pictures are optimized for the cloud, not for the edge. And secondly, uh, memory is pretty heavy. There's a lot of intermediate and, and, and used buffers, which is not an issue on the phone since the phone has gigabytes of memory, but microcontroller is really has a limited memory. And we have to compute the full gradients. Uh, it doesn't support sparse layer, sparse tensor update. Therefore, we propose the tiny training engine, which separates the runtime, which is here, and also the compile time. TTE, Tiny Training Engine, offloads most of the workloads like auto div graph optimization and perform tuning and into compile time. Okay? So the, the overhead of runtime run is minimized. So we first convert a pre-trained Python model into the forward IR. Okay? And after getting the forward IR, we compile them to a backward IR. For example, a convolution account 2D now becomes um, account 2D followed by calculating gradient to the input, count 2D transpose, and calculating the gradient to the weight, which is another count 2D, okay? So one convolution becomes three. And next we propose, uh, we perform this uh, graph optimizations, including uh, pruned operators for sparse layer, sparse tensor update, operator reordering and in-place update, constant folding and dead code elimination. First, um, rather than the full update, we which need to comp compute the forward and the backward for the uh, gradient to the uh, activation, to the weight, to the bias, for a uh, bias only update, we have uh, introduced this uh, flag called needs grad, okay? For example, the, um, uh, the, the gradient to the weight, we have needs grab to be false, okay? Therefore, we annotate whether a tensor requires gradient or not. For example, the weight doesn't require gradient. Then we can do bias only update. Therefore, we also uh, automatically remove those unnecessary computations from the uh, DAG via dependency analysis and dead code elimination. Since we don't need to calculate the gradient with respect to the weight, this transpose conf, transpose uh, matrix multiplication is, is deleted. For sparse layer update, for example, the first layer doesn't need to be updated, the needs grad needs to be false. And then second layer needs to be updated, the needs grad to be true. It, free, uh, it can freely annotate any parameters and TTE will automatically trim the computation graph accordingly. For sparse layer, sparse tensor update, we tell, uh, for example, for this layer, we need to update only half of the weights. Therefore, we give needs grads to be only 0 0.5, okay? So we can auto, uh, TTE automatically remove the buffers of the pruned gradients from the computational graph. 
for example, here we inserted a new line of code to slice the input activation to be only half of the original tensor size. And then we multiply with the trimmed tensor to realize the real memory saving. So the whole pipeline is automated and we can achieve up to 28X memory saving compared with the full update. Okay, so tiny training engines support the back, backward graph pruning and sparse update at the AR level. And after pruning, those unused weights and the tensors are pruned from the DAG, which resulted in uh, about eight to 10 X memory saving and combined with operator reordering that's 22 to 28 X memory saving. Okay, so the uh, next technique. I'm sorry, is... Professor Ann, a couple of minutes uh, left, uh, please. Okay, so given the limited amount of time, I will uh, summarize the comparison of TTE and compare our previous infra, where we basically move a lot of the optimizations into compile time and support supported um, this um, sparse layer and sparse tensor update. And before that, uh, beyond that, we also performed uh, multi-device uh, federated learning uh, by uh, reducing the bandwidth with deep gradient compression where we sparsify the gradient and accumulate the gradient. If they are not updated, can reduce the bandwidth by a hundred times and delay the gradient averaging that can tolerate a long latency rather than having to wait. And we set up a Raspberry Pi farm to perform the me uh, to measure the real speed up. Uh, to summarize, uh, we propose tiny ML tech. We work on tiny ML techniques from single sensor to multiple sensors, classic to quantum software to hardware, training to inference, sparse to dense, big models to tiny models. And we thank MIT AI hardware program for uh, supporting our research. And more of such code and demos are available on our GitHub as well as our uh, YouTube channel. Thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Professor Ann. There have been a, a lot of uh, questions uh, in the chat. Uh, let me try to select a uh, few for the five minutes Q&A. Uh, there are a couple of questions related to uh, input data, pre-processing, uh, uh, if there is a, when the MCU training happen, if there is uh, any change or optimization that involve input data uh, impacting the training uh, process? Uh, so it doesn't require changing the input data format. It just We just use the off-the-shelf image net to pre-train the model and fine tune it on downstream tasks, including Cypher, Food 101, Flowers, those widely available uh, image data sets. It doesn't require changing the input format. Okay, um, thank you. Um, there are a couple of questions related to the need to have available uh, data which are labeled uh, and uh, or splitting them uh, into training, validation and test. Uh, does it apply? So so th there is a good question. How do we get the labels? So in this demo, yeah. uh, we put the labels through this USB cable. Okay, so we put the uh, a microcontroller attached to a camera and pointed to the uh, to the image, and the labels are fed fed in through the USB, which is synchronized with um, with the change of the image. And also another way to put in the uh, label is by we can we also have a demo having a button. We have two buttons. Button one for class one, for button two for class two. Basically, this is showing initially we have random initialization and initial testing is giving wrong results for person versus no person. <coughs> and then uh, it runs about three uh, frames per second uh, on this STM32 F746 microcontroller. And later we do on device training um, to which have the image synchronized with the label. So it runs about 1.8 frames per second, running back propagation with only, and this is having 230 kilobytes of SRAM available. And we are going to fast forward a little bit until we finish the whole training data set. Uh, 
of this answer the question, this has been validated on real MCUs. Yeah. And then after, after training, we measure the post-training testing, okay? So this is no person, this is person, so it has been, everything is uh, correct. So basically, we are saying um, this is uh, working in real with a uh, real-world scenario measured on a real microcontroller. I think there was a question also related to your analysis on which layers to update. Uh, and uh, so the question uh, here is, how do you choose which layer to update uh, during uh, the on-device learning process? Oh, I talk about that. So it's using this uh, contribution analysis to profile the contribution of each layer and, and, and only update those more important layers. And also we need to consider which layer has a uh, low memory. So we are going to update those layers that has low memory footprint. And we use this constraint optimization to determine uh, the, the KIR um, uh, for uh, K is the number of biases. I is which layer need to update. R is the ratio for the update. There are really a lot of questions uh, happening uh, on the chat, which is a measure of how was uh, considered interesting your presentation. I think another, another question that was interesting to mention was related if uh, you use the or you foresee an impact on training uh, on, uh, on deep learning frameworks. Since you had this separation between uh, uh, compile time and uh, run time, uh, maybe the question was related if uh, uh, the deep learning framework has a role. Like... Uh, sorry, I just saw a question um, from Hacker. Do we need the entire training data set or calibration data Data will be sufficient? So here we can use a subset of cal calibration data to, to do the contribution analysis as long as the size of the data data set is meaningful so that we can uh, do the contribution analysis for the uh, accuracy. Since that one is can be performed on the cloud, we we can uh, accommodate a uh, pretty a decent amount of training data. Of course, the more the uh, the more accurate, the more data, the more accurate for the contribution analysis. Okay. Uh, why okay. comparing the bias only update or not the full update or classifier only update? So. The classifier only update is very low accuracy. It's way beyond below this figure. And actually, this blue curve is the updating the uh, last uh, the original accuracy. I believe is having this. We actually match fully matches the accuracy of updating the whole layer. So you can reference our paper for updating all the layers uh, accuracy. About and actually, the, yeah. the last K layers, if you uh, update all the K layers, that's basically the upper bound. So you, you see you see here. So this is the, basically the upper bound of updating all the layers when K equal to the number of layers. Basically, that's the accuracy for full update. Uh, thanks a lot for your time and for your presentation and also your help in uh, addressing some, uh, some questions, Professor Han. Thanks, uh, the strategic partners, uh, once again, because without them, uh, this uh, type of forum and other many other initiatives would be impossible to organize. And uh, uh, the strategic partners are ARM, very quickly, uh, Edge Impulse, um, Qualcomm, uh, then we have the Platinum uh, uh, strategic partner, Deep Light, Clicatec, Reality AI, Renaissance, Sony Semiconductor, uh, the Gold strategic partner, Analog Devices, PhotoHub, Microsoft, NXP, Seed Studio, uh, Sensimil, ST Micro. Synaptics, uh, Science Sense, uh, and then uh, a bunch of uh, strateg silver strategic partners, which are listed here. Uh, thanks a lot. It was really a great uh, afternoon for me and uh, whatever is your time zone. Thanks a lot. Uh,
no words to express gratitude to the professors and all to attendees for being patient uh, for the extra time. Thank you and see you tomorrow. Have a nice uh, day or evening. Bye.